reasons for doing our own set of simulations rather than using some existing data that's out there. Um, for one, I don't want to belabor the point, but um, GCM just can't capture the type of phenomena that we're looking at, that we want to look at, especially in the context of climate change. So we're not getting tropical cyclones, extreme precipitation, there are issues with the representation of blocking, all of these things that we're interested in looking at how climate change will affect, we can't do in GCMs. Um, so regional modeling with techniques like pseudo-global warming and downscaling are excellent ways to circumvent these resolution deficiencies of GCMs. With a smaller domain, we're really, um, that allows us to, to run at much finer grid spacings. But as Falco pointed out earlier, we're really constrained by those, those boundary conditions in the regional models, which is a big limitation of those methodologies. Some other groups have been doing some high resolution time slice experiments, which are really excellent. Um, but a lot of these simulations are done with coupled models. And the SST representation in these coupled models, as been shown by some recent work, um, can lead to some biases in regional climate projections. So for our method, we wanted to kind of combine bits and pieces from each of these techniques um, and create our own simulations. So we're using impasse, which we know is a global model. Um, it's atmosphere only, so that allows us to prescribe high resolution SSTs. And then for our climate change experiments, we're kind of doing pseudo-global pseudo, pseudo global warming and pseudo-time size experiments, which I'll talk more about here in a second. Lots of pseudos going on. So as I said, we're using impasse version 5.1. Uh, we have a variable resolution mesh, which is shown here. We have 15 kilometers over the entire northern hemisphere that expands out to 60 kilometers elsewhere. So a huge shout out to Michael Judah um, for creating this mesh for us. So 15 kilometers is not convective permitting, so we do have to have a CP scheme. Um, we chose TP for this CP scheme, mainly because of its inclusion of convective momentum transport, which we know is important for the representation of tropical cyclones. Um, and then we did some preliminary testing with the 60 kilometer mesh, the uniform mesh, to refine these physics choices further. Our initial conditions and our SSTs are taken from the ERA interim reanalysis. So we chose 10 years to simulate for this study. Um, we chose these years based on varying phases of ENSO. So we have a couple strong La Nina years, strong El Nino years, and several neutral, neutral years. Our simulations run from March 1st of the first year through mid-May of the second year. We chose this time span to encompass the full TC season, so June to November, um, and then with shoulder months on either side to account for possible shifts in TZ seasonality in our future simulations. And then we wanted to continue these simulations through a full winter season so that they can be used for a variety of research projects in the future. Uh, to simulate, uh, to, to take into the effects of climate change, um, we're basically simulating the same 10 years under future thermodynamic conditions. So this is along the lines of pseudo-global warming. We're calculating these temperature deltas from a 21-member CMET-5 ensemble and then tacking those on to the initial conditions. So these temperature deltas are calculated by subtracting the 1980 to 1999 um, average temperature from the 2080 to 2099 average temperature. An example for that is shown here for the month of March. So we're taking those temperature deltas, we're tacking those on to the initial conditions at all atmospheric levels, at all soil levels, and at sea surface temperatures, which I'll show in a second. And then we're also adjusting carbon dioxide to match the RCP 8.5 scenario as well. So once we have our warmed conditions, we can essentially just run that through impasse as is, and that gives us our future simulation for whatever year that we're working with. So as I said, for sea surface temperatures, we're um, working with those in the same way as we did the initial conditions. We're calculating those temperature deltas from the GCM ensemble and then tacking those in, uh, tacking those on to the ERA interim the sea surface temperatures. So those are the animations that you're looking at here. Um, this is for the 2013 simulation. We have our current sea surface temperatures here on the left and the future on the right, and then an example of the temperature delta that we applied is up here at the top. So handling the sea surface temperatures this way allows us to preserve those high resolution gradients while also accounting for the projected warming. It's also just fun to look at. Um, as was mentioned yesterday, we can't handle sea ice in the same way. It's not that simple. We can't just calculate the sea ice deltas from the CMET-5 ensemble and tack them on in the same manner. So our way around this is we use the monthly sea ice fields from our CMET-5 ensemble and then created pseudo daily sea ice fields by doing a 31-day running average. So we did this for the historical period, which is shown here. 
um, and then for the future period, which is shown here. Um, and then essentially we just replaced the sea ice in the ERA interim with these climatological fields. And what you're looking at, even though it says 2013 up here, um, we use the same sea ice fields in all of our simulations. All right, so we chose our 10 years. Those are listed here. Um, we don't have 10 chronological years, so we organized them um, from the strongest La Nina to the strongest El Nino. Uh, we wanted to conduct these simulations in a way to minimize the spin-up time as much as possible and also minimize the shock to the system from moving from one year to another as little as possible. Um, so we organized our years as such from strongest La Nina in 2010 to strongest El Nino in 1997. And then we first did, we chose a neutral ENSO year of 2013, and we did a full 14 and a half month spin-up sim simulation with this year. This is, like I said, a spin-up sim simulation. It's discarded from our analysis, and we came back and ran 2013 a little bit later. So what we did is we took the output from this run from March 1st, 2014, and then used that to initialize our 2010 run. Um, and then we continue with this sort of daisy chain method where we take the output from March 1st, 2011 to initialize our 1988 run and so on and so forth. So by doing it this way, we didn't have to do a full year of spin up for every simulation. Um, instead, we just discarded the first month so that any discontinuities from the shifting sea surface temperatures can come into equilibrium. So we've completed our 10 sets of simulations. Um, for the years, again, listed here. And we have post-processed our output. So by post-processing, we're interpolating our 3D fields to select pressure levels. And then we're interpolating all output to a 0.15 degree by 0.15 degree lat-long grid. Because of space constraints, um, we're only saving limited variables and only data for the northern hemisphere only. But we are saving restart files once a month. So if we or anybody else wants to go in and look at a certain time period or certain event in more detail, then we can use the restart files to do that. So for the remainder of the talk today, I'll show you proof that uh, the climate change simulations worked as we expected them to, uh, and then just some kind of model validation results for the present day simulations. So in evaluating whether or not our climate change simulations worked as we wanted them to, we were looking for two of the key warming signatures that show up in the GCMs, one of which is Arctic amplification. So shown here is a difference field of two meter temperature. This is for the month of March. So we have our steam at five ensemble mean difference on the top and our impasse 10 year mean on the bottom. Um, so keep in mind that our steam at five ensemble mean field is a 20 year mean temperature difference of 21 ensemble members. So this is a very smooth field compared to 10 impasse simulations. But as you can see, we are getting that Arctic amplification signal. Um, we're getting some of the maximums, the warming maximums in about the right places as well. So we were pleased to see that. The other warming signature that we are looking for is the warming maximum in the tropical upper troposphere, which you can see here in a cross section of zonal mean temperature. Again, this is a difference field, it's future minus current, so the warmer colors are indicating warmer in the future runs. So we have our steam at five ensemble mean plot here on the left, and then impasse over here, and you can see that we are getting that tropical upper tropospheric warming in our climate change simulations. So we were pleased that even with just basically warming the lower boundary and cranking up the CO2, we're able to replicate these signals, which was um, encouraging. So one of the model validation um, fields that we wanted to look at, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were getting the extropical storm tracks in our models. So those are super important. Um, to do this, rather than doing a Lagrangian tracking algorithm, we just looked at sea level pressure variance as a proxy for storm track activity. So we have the ERA climatology here on the top. Um, just to note that we did this climatology only using our 10 simulation years, uh, so a more apples to apples comparison. And then we have our 10 year impasse mean here on the bottom. And you can see that we do have both uh, the West Pacific or the North Pacific and the North Atlantic storm tracks are evident in our model. There are a couple differences. Um, for example, the Pacific storm track is slightly weaker and a little bit more zonally oriented than in the ERA climatology, but we don't expect them to match up perfectly. And if we do a pattern correlation co coefficient, it's really high with an R greater than 0.95. So we also wanted to look at tropical precipitation. Um, so I'm shown here is precipitation, annual precipitation in millimeters per day 
We have the trim 19-year climatology on the top and our impasse 10-year mean on the bottom. Um, so we can see that the ITCZ, especially in the Central Pacific, is well represented in the model. Um, but there are a couple key differences. So we are seeing that large overproduction and precipitation in the West, Western Pacific, as um, Nick showed in his three-kilometer runs as well. This might be linked to an overactivity um, of TC frequency that I'll talk about later, but we haven't really delved too much into what's causing this. Then the other thing I wanted to point out is uh, the shift in the precip max in the equatorial Atlantic. Um, so preliminary investigation into this, we found a shift in the African easterly jet that might be pushing the precip more to, towards the west here. So last thing I want to show is uh, tropical cyclones. So to look at tropical cyclones in our simulations, we use the Tempest Extreme tracking algorithm of Ulrich and Zarzicki 2017. So this algorithm initially detects cyclones as minimum and sea level pressure, and then retains candidate cyclone centers based on certain criteria. Um, you can set a sea level pressure, close sea level pressure contour, a warm core contour, um, warm core criteria, and things like that. I won't go into too much detail. I'm just leaving some of the parameters that we chose up here if you wanted to look back at them later for reference. So the first plot I have is a plot of tropical cyclone density. Um, so we have the IB tracks, 10-year climatology up here at the top, and the impasse 10-year mean down here at the bottom. So we are getting tropical cyclones in all the northern hemispheric basins, which is good. It's encouraging to see. Um, as I noted before, we're getting um, some increased frequency over the West Pacific. The main thing that probably jumps out at you is this lack of um, TC generation in the eastern North Atlantic. So these Cape Verde type storms, their frequency peaks in about August and September. And so when we took a closer look at these months, we saw that there was a huge positive bias of vertical wind shear in the model over this region during those months. So that's likely suppressing the TC activity there. Um, but overall, if we look at kind of just the distribution of tropical cyclone counts and of ACE, it matches climatology pretty well. So the last plot that I have here is looking at um, tropical cyclone strength. So this is that same pressure wind relationship as Falco showed earlier. Uh, we have maximum 10 meter wind speed in knots on the X axis and minimum sea level pressure on the Y axis. So the IB track storms are shown in the black dots. Um, the impasse storms are shown um, in the gray dots and then each distribution is fit with a second order uh, polynomial there. Um, the vertical lines here show the category thresholds based on the wind speed, based on the Sapir-Simpson scale. Um, and then the horizontal lines here show the category thresholds based on sea level pressure, as in Roberts et al., um, 2017. So if we look here um, at category four storms based on wind speed, we can see that we are getting a handful of cat four storms um, in, 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 in impasse, excuse me. Uh, which is still pretty good, but we're not getting any Cat, cat 5 storms. And then if we look at um, strength based on sea level pressure, though, we're getting a significant number of Category 5 storms there. So if we're looking at strength based on sea level pressure, impasse is simulating tropical cyclones across the full intensity spectrum, um, which is really encouraging. So just a note, we are running atmosphere only. We have no ocean coupling. Um, which is, we talked about earlier, can inflate the strength of the tropical cyclones themselves. Um, on the flip side, we're also running with a CP scheme, which can degrade the intensity of TC. So those mechanisms are probably offsetting each other in, in some way, um, just something to keep in mind. So just to summarize, um, we showed that our future impasse simulations do replicate the two key warming signatures that we see in the GCN, so Arctic amplification, and the warming maximum in the tropical upper troposphere, we're both getting just by warming the lower boundary and cranking up the CO2. Um, and then we're getting some realistic representation of large scale mean fields like the mid latitude storm tracks um, and tropical precipitation. We do have TC activity generated in all northern hemispheric basins. And if we look at um, intensity based on sea level pressure, we are getting storms across the full intensity spectrum. So as I mentioned, um, the primary goal of my portion of this project is to A, do the model runs, and then to look at the climate change effects on the extropical transition of TCs. Um, but we have some other ongoing projects in our group. So we have some, one looking at extreme precipitation on the US East Coast, someone looking at changes in TC seasonality 
and then also looking at persistent anomalies or blocking events as well. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you.